Well, I'll try to be brief because I'm tired. It's past my bedtime. Um, and I'm, shoot, there's no way, I shouldn't be on this schedule of speakers. I know you don't know who any of these people are, but they're all heroes of faith for me, so it's kind of exciting just to be in the room and listen to Larry James talk. Larry's a big, James, a big deal in my world. And uh, what I'd like to do is um, sort of continue with some of the text that he, or similar text that he used, and share just uh, for a minute with you out of my own failure. Um, so uh, Luke writes two volumes, Gospel of Luke and in the book of Acts. And uh, in, in the church that I preach for in Atlanta, Campus Church, almost every Sunday if you come to our church, you'll hear somebody say, hey, we're going to gather around the table, even though we don't really gather around the table, and we're going to share cup and bread together. And it doesn't matter who you are or what you believe or where you've been, you are welcome at this table. And we have an open table, and uh, so we'll sometimes say, you might not even believe in Jesus. You might be anti-Jesus, and you are welcome at this table uh, this morning. And uh, we, we base that proclamation largely out of the Gospel of Luke and Luke's intention, among other things, to proclaim that everyone was welcome at the table of the Lord. I defy you to go to the Gospel of Luke and prove otherwise. It doesn't matter who you are, if you're a tax collector or a prostitute or even a Pharisee, which is the worst of sinners in the, in the Gospel of Luke, you are welcome to sit down at a table with Jesus. Luke builds this case over and over and over again in the Gospel of Luke, and then he starts a second volume, the book of Acts, and tells about this, this explosion of radical faith that is born out of the table of Jesus. And then in chapter 5, he tells this really weird story about how these two people who were engaged in, with this community in radical faith, and people are, people are devoting themselves to the resurrected Lord. They're gathering at tables with all kinds of people, Jew and Gentile. They're selling their possessions and giving them to the poor, sharing them with one another. And there's a couple who sells their possessions, and they bring a good chunk of that to the table to be shared with everyone else. And they sort of fib about whether they brought it all or not. Luke has, to this point, built this case. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. You are welcome at the table of the Lord with Jesus. And these two sell their stuff, and they come to the table, and God zaps them dead right there for fibbing about how much they brought to the table. I don't know if you've heard sermons on that passage or if you've squirmed when you heard sermons on that passage. This is my reading of that story. That there is room for everyone at the table of the Lord except pretenders. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. If you're a prostitute or a tax collector or a Pharisee, you are welcome in Jesus' home. And you are welcome at his table. There's one thing that you cannot do. And that is pretend. You don't get to come to Jesus' table and pretend to be better than you are. You're welcome in your lowliest state at Jesus' table. Just be you when you come to his table. Don't come to his table pretending to be greater than you are. Because if you do, you will really harm everyone else who has gathered at the table of the Lord. So when I was a college student at Harding, um, there was this old preacher. I, I don't know how old he was at the time, but he seemed really old. And then he lived a lot of years after that. So his name was Stanley Ship, And um, you, you uh, college students probably don't know who, who Stanley was, but the older... The older ones, the more seasoned ones in the room know who Stanley was. He was crazy. And um, he used to talk about the kingdom of God and about Jesus and about 
what would it look like if, and he was talking to all of us college kids, what would it look like if, if you decided to move to St. Louis, he lived in St. Louis, move to St. Louis where I live, and join me in living like Jesus? What would happen in St. Louis if we all just walked around every day living like Jesus? And he would say, he would say things like, I've been praying that the economy in America would completely collapse. That's my prayer, that the economy in America would completely collapse so we would all have to learn together how to trust Jesus. Well, I didn't know anything about the economy in America because I didn't have any money. I didn't have a car. I, I, I had to go to Little Rock and give plasma if I wanted to go on a date. <laughs> Luckily for me, I rarely went on a date. Yeah, I know. Really lucky. I didn't know anything about the economy, but I knew that there was something that really drew me. Yeah, what would happen if we were all in great need and had to completely trust in one another and in God for, for survival? I was sort of drawn to this Stanley Ship character. He would say things like, um, if, if there's not a possibility of a gang war breaking out at your church on Sunday morning, you're doing something wrong. I heard him say that all the time. There's something about that I really liked. He seemed like he was less churchy and more Jesus-y, you know? He, in, he invited as many of us as wanted to, to move to St. Louis in the summer times. And he was planting the seed that maybe we would move there when we graduated and follow him around as he followed Jesus, painting pictures of, the kingdom of God breaking out in a city where everyone's welcome at the table of the Lord and what it might look like. And so I did. I, I, I scrapped the plans that I had for the summer and I moved to St. Louis with some other college kids and we lived in basements and I didn't have a car there either and we bummed rides. And we would go to these uh, this, this little rundown offices in the mornings and we would study scripture for hours like we're doing like we're doing here and then they would Stanley and others would send us out into the city with with little to no training and no agenda go out into the city and see who you can find and then come back and we'll talk about it so we would go out and make fools of ourselves and learn and 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 and, and, and practice ministry in the city and then come back and talk about it. I didn't know that a couple of things were happening to me. One thing that was happening to me was I was learning to see people, as Landon talked about earlier. I would come back to Harding and then discover that I was living with a bunch of pagans at Harding. I thought I was training to be a minister to go minister after Harding. I came back to Harding and realized, man, these people who live in my dorm are really lost. There was a guy that lived across the hall from me named Dave who, who didn't believe in God. And I knew that he didn't believe in God. I never, never had a conversation with him about it. And I didn't know how. No one had ever taught me how to do that. And my roommate and I had spent a summer with Stanley. And so my roommate and I were talking, hey, you know, I see Dave. And I never saw him before, but I see him. And now we have to do something about it. So we decided, well, we're going to go over and say something to him. And it was really awful. It was really bad. We... We went and stood outside his door and had a little prayer. Lord, please don't let Dave be here before we knock on the door, right? Because we don't know what we're going to say. We drew straws. Who's going to have to do the talking? I had to do the talking. Knock on the door. Dave comes to the door. We both look at the ground. Dave, we know you don't believe in God. If you ever want to talk about it, you know where we are. Okay, well, do you want to talk about it? No. Okay, see you later. Went back to our dorm room and shut the door. That was the last conversation we ever had with Dave about God or anything like it. But we had crossed a huge hurdle. I was actually here a couple of years, uh, uh, no, many years after I graduated, is, is quite a while back, and I was at a little diner in Searcy, and Dave came up to me. He was living, in, he was in Searcy for some reason, and his wife with him, and he came up. I hadn't seen him since, since we had been in college together. And he leaned in, he said, hey, I just want you to know, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And I remember the day that you and Tim came to my dorm room. <laughs> and I turned red, I'm pretty sure. 
and sort of laughed and he said, you weren't very good at that, you know. <laughs> yeah, duh. I'm still not very good at it. He said, but I, um, I watched you after that day. You planted a seed in my mind and I, I watched you after that. In the summer with Stanley, I learned to see people around me. But something else was happening to me that wasn't so great. Somehow, without realizing it, the, the stories that Stanley was telling that were painting a picture of the wonders of the kingdom of God were beginning to become, in my mind and heart, stories about Dusty doing great things in the kingdom of God. For some of you, what I'm going to share, it doesn't mean anything to you because you're just naturally humble. But there might be one other egomaniac in the room. <laughs> you know what it's like to go from having a wonderful dream about the kingdom to having a wonderful dream about yourself and attaching the kingdom to it. So I would go out in the afternoons, and, and I, I wasn't like it was conscious, but Deep down, more than hoping to progress the kingdom of God, I was hoping to stumble upon a wonderful ministry story that Stanley would fall in love with and tell. And say, let me tell you about the kingdom of God. And he would tell a story about something that I had done. And one day, my, uh, I was partnered with a guy named Jeff, and we, 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 we were commissioned to go do random ministry. And so we decided to go to the VA that was down in North City, St. Louis a couple of years ago. North City, St. Louis declared the most dangerous inner city in America. Mm -hmm. Go down to the VA in North City, St. Louis. We don't know what to do. And so we're walking around the halls. We landed on the eighth floor and we're walking around the halls. And in the, this was a pretty run down VA. There are three or four men in each room. And we can't quite pull the trigger to go in a room. Remember, I'm the guy who knocks on Dave's door. I don't exactly have great ministry skills, right? I'm the guy who failed preaching class at Harding. And the teacher's name was Easy Eddie Cloer, right? <laughs> they called him Easy Eddie because it was easy to make an A. I got an F on every sermon I ever preached in Easy Eddie Cloer's class. It, I was a senior, by the way. I had to call him the night before graduation and say, I've gotten an F on every class. I'm afraid that when I rock, walk across the stage tomorrow that my little thing is going to be empty, right? And he, he said, oh, well, you know, I don't fail preachers. That would be really sad, so I gave you a C, right? <laughs> F on every... I'm not really great at this. We're walking around the halls, and we can't quite find the courage to go in a room, right? Either, either there are family members, or they're watching TV, or some excuse after another after another. We finally find a room um, where there is one man lying on his bed with his eyes open, doing nothing. And um, so we go into the room, and it's clear that he's dying. And um, if you, I don't know if you've ever been in, in that kind of a room, but you can kind of hear death coming, you know? You can just feel it and hear it coming. And what we have here is a man who just really needs to not die alone. But I'm, I'm not thinking about the man or even the kingdom of God. I, I was kind of thinking about me and Stanley. And so I sort of burst into a room full of the silence of death with my gospel spiel. And I give it to him for several minutes. And he seems to be showing no gratitude that I've, that I've spent my summer in St. Louis for him and for people like him, and that I've risked my life to come all the way down here, and that I've, I risked, I've risked humiliation, I've given him my time, and I'm sharing the gospel with him. And he's just light, sort of lying there staring at me. And I realize quickly that there's nothing in this moment for me. You know, I'm not thinking through it quite like that. I'm just looking back and interpreting my heart. And so I decide... I better work on my exit speech. I give him a little sermonette, and then I pray for him, and I bless him. And Jeff and I, Jeff hasn't said a word. He's 
greater pagan than I am. We're backing out of the room. And I say something like, hey, maybe we'll come back later this week. But in my heart, I know I'm never coming back to this room because you have nothing to offer me. I know that, there, that really many of you would have never done that or thought that, but that's where I was. As I was, the story gets worse. As I was walking out the room, he has not said one word the whole time I'm in there. As I was walking out the room, I saw him sort of move and gesture toward me. And so I, so I, I, I sort of paused long enough to have to admit that I saw him, right? If I'd, if I'd been quick enough, I would have kept on walking and pretended like I didn't know that he wanted to say something. I paused for a moment. Jeff is out in the hall and he can't, he can't speak very well because he's nearly dead. And he asks in a whisper, would you just watch me? And I turned around and I left. I just left him there. Went and got in the car and drove away. I, when, I, when I said I'm going to share out of my failures, that's what I meant. And I've got other stories like that one. Everyone is welcome at the table of the Lord except pretenders. Because pretenders hurt people. When the radical gospel life becomes more about you being a radical gospel disciple and less about the people who need the kingdom of God, you begin to hurt people. And you lose your chair at the table of the Lord. So Jesus says to pretenders, in chapter 11 of the Gospel of Luke. In verse 37, when Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went and reclined at the table, but the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Then the Lord, by the way, the way I read the Pharisees is I read them as radical disciples turned selfish. I I read them as you, you and I, without the warning, watch out. Be, Be careful that the story doesn't become about you and that you then become a pretender. I read the story of the Pharisees as they're the guys who are just like the disciples of Jesus, but they didn't have Jesus to pull them aside and say, hey, listen, watch out for the yeast of the pretenders. There is danger in the radical nature of being a disciple. There's this danger. There are the claws of the enemy wanting to pull you into pretense. Be careful of that because that is the one way that you can lose your seat at the table of the Lord. So to the pretender, Jesus says, Now then, you Pharisees, you, in other passages he calls them play actors or hypocrites, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now, as, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. And we love to paint this picture of the Pharisees as, as if they could be so distant from us that they never really had an imagination for what the kingdom of God could look like in the world now. But they began as a group of people who imagined that the kingdom of God would visit in their generation. And so they set their minds to radical discipleship to the words and to the laws of God so that God would make his kingdom present in their day. But they lost the vision of the kingdom for a vision of themselves and they missed the arrival of the kingdom of God in their day. What a sad story. And what a clear warning for you and me. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, 
rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. You poor former radicals. I'm concerned for you. I know that you wanted to be one thing and you had this grand vision, but what you've become is fake. You've become a people who proclaim one thing, but really you're another. Not sinners, not prostitutes or tax collectors or sinners, people who own their sin are welcome at the table of the Lord. What you've become is people who proclaim the kingdom and pretend to be greater than it. You've become pretenders. And what has happened to you in your pretense, and we can, we, none of us can imagine this happening to us. What has happened to you in your pretense is you have grown to care nothing about God, about justice, or about the people who need justice. But you care a lot about yourselves and whether you receive honor from others. We can't imagine that happening to us. It happens to me every day. It happens to me when I sit in a room full of college kids and I know I've been invited to speak and Ross Cochran gets up and then Landon Saunders gets up and then Randy Harris and then Larry James and I'm over in my seat and I'm wrestling with, I really want to love college kids and say a good word and I really want to be as great as those guys are. How sad is that? That's pretense. That's allowing my own concerns and my own agenda to rise above the gospel and the kingdom of God and the love of God and the love of people. So I'm wrestling with, God, I want to love college kids, but I really love me. And I want to love college kids, but my mind and my heart, they keep gravitating toward me and loving me more than them. But I don't want to lose my seat at the table of the Lord. So be careful, disciples. Those of you choosing to give your lives to a radical way, be careful of the yeast of your preachers. Be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees, the pretense that infects churches and destroys communities because it promotes the love of self above the love of God and the love of human beings. Anybody, anybody read Ken, is it Ken Follett or Ken Follet? Follet. Fall it? The fall it. All right. The Fall of Giants. Have you read The Fall of Giants? I'm a big Ken Follett fan. Ken Follett wrote this trilogy about World War, World War I, World War II, and then the third one's not very good. We needed three world wars to make the trilogy really good. He begins The Fall of Giants with this story about Billy Twice. Remember that story? Billy Twice. He's called Billy Twice because his name is Billy Williams. Billy Billy. And everyone in his community sort of has a nickname. That's kind of just how they, how they are. There's Jim the shop. His wife runs a shop. They're not really creative nicknames. <laughs> right? There's Johnny Crybaby. That's his name. That's what they call him, Johnny Crybaby, because Johnny, it's a coal mining community. And every kid, when he turns a certain age, has to go down and work in the mines. And Johnny couldn't help. He cried. He was so afraid he cried all the way down. And so that's his name, Johnny Crybaby. 
Billy twice. It could be worse. He tells a story about Billy twice in his first day to go down in the mines. Billy's family has some enemies, and it just so happens that the foreman in charge of Billy that day is an enemy of the family. They get on this thing that's called the cage. It can hold 12 men, something like that. And they go down beneath the earth. And when it's your first time, you're terrified, right? What is waiting for me down there? And Will I survive? Will I cry? Will I be a child or will I, will I be a man? He's doing everything he can to hold back the screams and the, and the tears and own his, own his manhood, right? He goes down into the, into the darkness of the mines and, 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 and men and, and, and the boys that are there for their first time, they're given assignments. And the foreman who's taking Billy twice to give him an assignment, takes him the furthest. and he, he, they go, it's, it's pitch black down there, and they have these little lamps, these little lanterns that they carry, and they wind their way back and forth, all the way back deep into the mines, and Billy's lost if it's not for this foreman who hates him. And he tells him, here's what you're going to do there, back and far away from everyone else, you're going to shovel this, this filth into this dram. You're going to spend your day doing that. Let me check your lantern before I go. He says, your lantern doesn't look good. I'm going to give you mine. Here's my lantern. And he leaves him all alone back in the mines. Well, it's not very long before his lantern goes out. And um, so Billy experiences darkness like he's never experienced before. He holds his shovel up to his face right in front of his nose, and he can't see the shovel. That's how dark it is. He couldn't go for help even if he wanted to. He, He doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know the way out. If he tries to wander off and find someone, he's afraid he'll become even more lost and they'll have to send a search party party after him and no telling what his name will be then, right? And so he stays there terrified. And he continues to do his work. He knows nothing else to do. So he continues to do his work and he, he, he shovels dirt and then he wanders and stumbles over to where the large dram is and he lifts the shovel above the dram and drops it in and and he's, he's terrified and his mind is wandering to all sorts of things that he could be afraid of. And so he, he works harder to try and take his mind off of the things that he should be afraid of. And in the, in the height of his fear, he remembers something that his mother has always told him since he was a little boy. Jesus is always with you, Billy. And before this moment, he had always received that word as a threat, right? Jesus is always with you, Billy. But hey, Jesus is always looking, right? Now he realizes the, realizes the wisdom of his mother. Jesus is always with you. Even in the darkest place that you could find yourself, Jesus is with you. Billy, in this moment, chooses to be a believer. He has no other choice. And so, having gone to church two or three times every Sunday, all of his life, he chooses to, instead of filling his mind with fear, Filling his mind, he chooses to fill his mind with Jesus, and so he begins to sing hymns in the dark, all alone, far beneath the earth. He sings them once and twice and three times, over and over again, singing the name of Jesus, so much so that he is sure, even though he's still a little bit afraid, he is sure, even though he cannot see the shovel in front of him, that he he sees Jesus in the corner. And Jesus is compassionate toward his suffering. Well, Billy spends all day beneath the earth, shoveling in the darkness. When his enemy finally comes with light, he finds him singing, up from the grave he arose, and shoveling dirt beneath the earth. The enemy says, what happened to your lamp? And Billy, he's become a man now. He says, you know what happened to my lamp. And that's all. They walk back to the cage. They get back onto the cage with the same men that they came down with. And the men are they're giggling a little bit. Evidently, this is something that you do to all the boys when they come down. But what the men in the cage don't know is that instead of leaving Billy alone for one hour, which is what they do to all the boys beneath the earth, that Billy's enemy left him down there alone all day. They're giggling and they're asking him, well, how did your day go? It was okay. Well, what, what, did anything happen? Well, my, my lamp went out and I shoveled in the dark all day. 
Now the men are serious. They can't believe what has happened to him. One of the boys asks, were you afraid? And Billy chooses to be honest, and he says, I was afraid. The boy asks, were you afraid alone in the dark? And Billy says, I was very much afraid, but I was never alone. What do you mean you weren't alone? And Billy says, I was with Jesus. And Follette, Follette writes that only one giggled at that answer, but the rest of them took it seriously. And from that day forward, they called him Billy with Jesus. I love that story. It's not a Christian book, by the way. Billy with Jesus. I'm wrestling with, I want to love you well, but I kind of want the story to be about me. And I'm reminded of Jesus' warning about the yeast of the Pharisees. And I want to embrace a story that goes something like Dusty with Jesus. The story that is much more about him than it is about me. I think that's what it would look like to be a radical disciple of Jesus. For the story to be about him and not about me. Well, I know most of you, like my wife, this sermon would be so wasted on her. <laughs> There's not a, there is not an ounce of her that's concerned about telling a story about herself. And so I know for some of you, this is a waste of time, but I'm just betting there might be one other egomaniac in the room that would be susceptible to the yeast of the Pharisees. I want to give you this hope-filled warning. Don't lose your seat at the table of the Lord. You are welcome at his table as long as you are you. In all of your mess, in all of your failure, not just past, but present, in all of your lowliness and nastiness, in all of your stink, you're welcome at the table of the Lord. My prayer is that the Lord will come upon you in the power of His Spirit and that He will do great things in you. Lord, I lift up these uh, college students and some of the old people that are present too. I hold them up to you in love. I pray that through your spirit, you would create a fire in their hearts. That you would, you would create and stir up in them a deep, deep love for you and for other human beings. And that you would help them to become completely lost in your story and in the name of Jesus. Amen.